I am so excited about the appearance of my next guest because when I've been speaking about the need to mingle, the need to reconnect as a society, I often cite the work of Jonathan Haidt. Almost as often as I cite the work of Gene Twangy and the great author of iGen. And by the way, they are collaborators. They are partners. So, too, with another friend of the show, Lenore Skenazy. It's as if all of my, you know, professional worlds have collided. And I, I want to tell Jonathan at the outset that I, I see his work as part of a much larger narrative uh, of any number of authors, all of whom I've had the privilege of hosting on this program, Robert Putnam and Bowling Alone, Bill Bishop and The Big Sort, Charles Murray and Coming Apart, Richard Louvre. Richard Louvre is the guy when he wrote Last Child in the Woods, had to be like 15 years ago who put the idea on my agenda that we got to get our kids into the backyard with unstructured play and out of the house. Um, David Brooks, in his recent book, To Know a Person, Gene Twangy, of course, with iGen. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist from NYU. You will remember that he co-authored the bestseller with Greg Lukianoff, another guest on the program, The Coddling of the American Mind. That was a book that addressed several interwoven threads, including the rise of anxiety and depression in Gen Z and the overprotection of our kids, which began in the 1990s. But now Jonathan Haidt is back with a brand new book called The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. The book drops formally tomorrow. You can pre-order it today. He's getting tremendous attention over the weekend profiled in the New York Times, Axios at the end of last week. Um, really all over the place and deservedly so. So, Jonathan Haidt, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations. I love the book. It's stunning. I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. The thesis, let's just get to it up front. Play-based childhood has been replaced by a phone-based childhood, and that is the cause of our mental health crisis. That's right. Um, so, Michael, thanks so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. The list of people that you mentioned, it's clear, all of them and you and me, we all see something is fraying in our social fabric, something is weakening about community and communion. And that's kind of the backstory to what happened to Gen Z. Um, the, the mental health of adolescents in the 1990s and the 2000s was actually pretty good. It, it was getting slightly better than it was for Gen X. The millennials were okay. And then right around 2012, all of the indicators of despair, depression, anxiety, suicide, all those began rising, rising, rising. We, a mental health crisis began in the early 2010s, and my book is about what caused it. And in brief, the thesis is that human childhood is this amazing evolutionary adaptation for our large brain species to develop slowly and learn and learn and learn about a culture, learn about what you're supposed to do, learn the roles, learn social skills. That takes a long time. And play is nature's way of doing that. So we had play-based childhoods for the last many millions and millions of years. That's what kids are supposed to do is play. Uh, and in 2010, um, in 2010, kids still, they had flip phones. Um, they weren't online all the time. You couldn't be online all the time in 2010. Few people had uh, high-speed internet. No, but few, nobody had Instagram. But by 2015, all that changed. Uh, most kids have uh, high-speed internet, Instagram, smartphone, front-facing camera. And now you start having kids online all day long. Like some say, half of them say literally they're online almost constantly. So my argument is that there was a great rewiring of childhood between 2010 and 2015 in which we lost the play-based childhood entirely. And what substituted for it was the phone-based childhood. And a human being can't grow up on a phone. You say in the book that you didn't set out to write this book. Explain. My research is primarily on moral psychology, and I've taken that into political psychology. And that's the work that first brought you and me together many years ago. Um, and I've been so alarmed by what's happening to American democracy, and I had a strong feeling that it had something to do with the rapid change in our social media environment, in our connections, our communication, our news media. So I, I set out to write a book, and I got a contract to write a book titled Life After Babel, Adapting to a World We May Never Again Share. And I uh, wrote the first chapter of that book. My plan was, well, I've got this side project on teen mental health left over from the coddling of the American mind. 
let me write chapter one about what happened to young people when they moved their social lives onto social media. And then the rest of the book will be about, you know, look how it messed them up. Now let's look at how it messes up democracy. But once I'd finished that first chapter and I assembled all the graphs, the graphs are horrifying. Uh, it became clear that there is a gigantic, there's an epidemic of mental illness. And when I discovered, working with my research partner, Zach Rausch, when I discovered that it's international, it's happening in Canada, Britain, the U, the U, uh, Australia, New Zealand, it's happening in Scandinavia, it's happening in many, many countries at the same time in the same way, I realized, wait a second, I can't just say this in one chapter and move on. I have to really dig into this. And as I kept digging in and expanding, it became a whole separate book. So I cut the book in half, and the 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 first half of the the first half of the of the series is the anxious generation, focusing on what happened to teens. Jonathan Haidt, why was 2012 such a significant year? It's it, well, it, it might be a specifically significant year because Facebook buys Instagram in 2012, and. Uh, that's what Facebook, uh, Instagram was founded in 2010, you know, for photographers, not that many people on it the first year or two. It's really 2012 that, um, that, that Instagram has a huge increase, but I don't want to blame this all on Instagram. I don't know. I, I don't, we don't know exactly what it was. All we know is that in 2010, there was no sign of a mental health crisis. If you look at all the graphs, you couldn't detect anything going on. If you stopped in 2012, by 2015, it's all over the place and people are beginning to see it on campus everywhere. So something changed. I, you know, I sometimes will say around 2012, but let's just say 2010 to 2015 with 2012 a particular focal focus. I'm going to read from the start of chapter two. I, I love the Rip Van Winkle discussion. You say this. Imagine that you fell into a deep sleep on June 28, 2007, the day before the iPhone was released. Like Rip Van Winkle, the protagonist in an 1819 story by Washington Irving, you wake up 10 years later and look around. The physical world looks largely the same to you, but people are behaving strangely. Nearly all of them are clutching a small glass and metal rectangle, and any time they stop moving, they assume a hunched position and they stare at it. They do this the moment they sit down on a train or enter an elevator or stand in line. There's an eerie quiet in public places. Even babies are silent, mesmerized by these rectangles. When you do hear people talking, they usually seem to be talking to themselves while wearing white earplugs. It's so brought home how much of a game changer this has been for all of our day-to-day -day lives. That's right. It's affecting all of us. That's actually a good way to get into this. Most people feel fragmented, overwhelmed. You know, many people who are your age, my age, remember the internet coming out. Remember the first time you used a web browser it was incredible. And then the first time you got an iPhone, again, incredible. We thought this stuff was magic. We thought this stuff was powerful. We thought it was delightful. And it was early on. But when you get this combination of things happening in the early 2010s, including super viral social media, once you get the retweet and like button in 2009, social media gets much nastier, much more about mob dynamics. We all get smartphones and they're wonderful at first. They don't have notifications and there's no app store. But by 2015, we're getting notifications every few minutes and there's a million apps and they're vying for our attention. So when you look at what's happened to us adults, I rarely meet somebody who says, oh gosh, I just love the modern electronic age. It's so great. Like we're all feeling overwhelmed, fragmented, confused. Our days are full of just responding to texts and messages all day long. Now imagine what it's like to be a child to be 10, 11 years old, when you should be out playing, climbing trees, getting into fights with other kids. I mean, not fist fights necessarily. I just mean you should be having normal childhood experiences. But instead, what you do is you go to school and in between classes, you're on your phone. You don't talk to other kids because, you know, you, you, you didn't check your text for an hour, for 40 minutes. You have to be on your phone between classes. At lunch, you might be talking to other kids, but they're all looking at their phones as well. So there's this, it, it's as though, it's almost like invasion of the body snatchers. It just was so sudden and it changed lives for all of us. When Jean Twangy wrote iGen, and I was immediately taken with that book, I, I knew what she had on her hands from the first time I cracked that cover. But I remember having a conversation with her on CNN, this was 2017, and she was, she was very cautious and deliberate in mm -hmm. speaking only of correlation. That's no longer yes. the case. The two of you are collaborators and the anxious generation 
flat out says it is causation. Address that issue to somebody who's listening to Jonathan Haidt and they're saying, "Okay, I get it. We're all using phones. And yes, there's a mental health problem. But maybe it's the aftermath of September 11. Maybe it's climate change. Maybe it's war in Gaza. There's a lot of bad stuff going on, not the least of which is political discord. Address that. Sure. Um, So we love to think in stories. We love to assume that something happened which caused this. And everyone's got their story of something that happened, but none of those stories work in all the countries, in so many countries. So I think our what we need to be doing is what you know, what is it that that changed? And let's look at that. Now, within the within the research psychology community, what Jean was doing was being cautious because when she came out with her findings that there is a mental health crisis, she was widely attacked. Yep. She had three years of data showing big increases. And a lot of people said, oh, that's just self-report data. Oh, you know, there's no real crisis. You're, you're doing a moral panic over kids and technology. Everybody does that. Comic books, you know, Socrates, every, you know, that was the usual argument. So Jean was very careful. And I joined her after the Kotlin came out. And I said, Jean, we need to really get to the bottom of this. And so Jean and I collected in a Google Doc, if you go to anxiousgeneration.com slash reviews, anxiousgeneration.com slash reviews, that's the webpage of the book. We, I, we have about, about 15 Google Docs that Gene and I and, and Zach Rausch have created where we put all the studies together. The main one is called, I think, social media and mental health. We, we categorize, we've got, you know, like dozens and dozens of correlational studies, but those don't show causation, sure. But then we have longitudinal studies where you, you take a measurement time one, see if does it predict time two. Those generally do show that you can infer causation from those. But the most powerful evidence is experiments. When social psychologists say, oh, it's just, you know, there's only correlational evidence. Well, now that we have so many true experiments with random assignment, and the great majority do show an effect, uh, we also have quasi-experiments where you look at what happened when high-speed internet came into a region of Spain, or there's one in, in British Columbia, and you look at how, as it comes into different parts, does mental illness go up in those parts first? And the answer is yes. So we now have an enormous amount of experimental and quasi-experimental evidence. And the way the game of science is played is once you have the experiments, you get to say that A caused B. And that's what we can show. Jonathan Haidt is the author of a brand new book. It's called The Anxious Generation, a stylistic compliment, if I might. There's a lot of data in the book, but you are constantly resetting as you go and summarizing that the ground that you've already covered. One of the points that you make and explain is how young men, young women, um, are impacted significantly in different ways. Say something about that. Yes. So once um, once kids get iPhones, they don't get them in 2007, 2008. They're expensive. Um, it's really, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013 is when kids are moving on to smartphones. And once they do that, the girls are now drawn just magnetically to social media. That's what girls are most interested in is relationships, who's saying what about who, images, the boys are mad- magnetically drawn to devices too, but they're doing more video games and, and YouTube. They're also getting incredible multiplayer video games on, on, other, on other platforms. So all the, the boys and the girls are all online all the time or a huge amount of the time. It's actually seven to nine hours a day is what American teens now spend online outside of school, not counting homework. So it's a huge amount of time, but boys and girls make different choices. Um, what we can show quite clearly is that social media is harmful to girls. Girls who are heavy users of social media are two to three times more likely to be depressed and anxious, and there's evidence showing causation. For boys, I can't really show that social media is what's causing their increase in depression. We saw in those Senate hearings, lots of boys get into huge trouble. There's mob dynamics, bullying, sextortion, all kinds of terrible things can happen to boys on social media too. But it doesn't seem to just make them anxious and fragile the way it does to girls. For boys, the problem is different. Boys basically have been withdrawing from the real world since the 70s and 80s. Um, Richard Reeves in his book of Boys and Men has shown that girls are going up and up and up since the 70s, you know, doing great in, in education, in employment. They've closed gaps. They've reversed gaps. Boys are dropping out. Um, boys are not as likely to graduate high school, not as likely to go to college, not as likely to become doctors or lawyers as girls are. At every level, boys are dropping out. You don't see it as much among rich boys and girls, but as you move down the SES ladder, middle class and below, huge gap between the success of boys and girls because the boys are so easily lured onto their devices for pornography and video games. Sex and violence are enormous interests for boys, and now they can get those satisfactions without ever doing any work, any difficulty that would lead them to develop skills useful as an adult. For example, 
flirting, talking to a girl, asking a girl out. You never do that. You just have porn and video games all day long. Well, to use my right to use my dated description to get shot down. Like there was a lesson of yes. life that when when there was something called a date and I would actually have to call her house and pray that her father didn't answer the phone because I'd have to talk yeah. my way through him and maybe adapt uh, adopt some social skills in the process. I, I want to make sure that I spend some time on prescriptions because you lay those out, Jonathan Haidt, in the book. But this is an important question. You're essentially advocating for less supervision in the backyard and mm-hmm. more supervision online and the question is why can't exactly. kids why can't kids become less fragile through the rough and tumble of their device in mm-hmm. the way that you're advocating they become on the mm-hmm. playground yeah 10 years ago i would have said you know in theory that might work let's see and what's now clear is that it doesn't work we evolved childhood in the real world a three-dimensional world full of people and animals and trees and rocks and that's where we need to run around and develop our skills We sometimes get embarrassed, we make mistakes, people laugh at us, but it was never a thousand people laughing at us. It's low stakes, low cost. Children learn from play where the cost of mistakes is low. You can make mistakes over and over again, like you just did. You might've maybe blew one of those calls with the father and then you're embarrassed. And that's the end of it. Right. But what if everything you said could be broadcast to everyone in the school? That would be terrifying. It's never gone. That's true for every moment of your life. That is, and it's never gone. That's right. That's right. So I've, I've talked with many students about this and I say, have you ever been shamed online? Have you ever been had a mob, you know, making fun of you and shaming you? Most have. I say, does that make you tougher? Does that make you feel like, you know what? I've been publicly shamed so many times. I don't care. Or does it make you more gun shy? Like, whoa, you know, I, I'm going to tread carefully here. Right. And they say it's the latter. You get so it just it doesn't make you tougher. Whereas running around, falling down, falling on your bicycle, climbing a tree and getting hurt. All of that actually makes you tougher. So it just doesn't work. And that's why a theme of the book, as you were just picking up on, is that we have overprotected our children in the real world where they need huge and varied, huge amounts of varied experience. We've underprotected them online, which is an environment created for adults, zero protections for children, zero age gating, pornography, sextortion, drug sales, whatever adults want is there. And there is zero protection for kids. Not only that, Congress has said, we can't even sue the platforms. They can show our kids whatever they want, and we can't do a damn thing about it. So this is horrible. This has to change. I'm not giving away all of the anxious generation for free. I want everybody to buy it, read it, appreciate it. But I have I have three questions for Jonathan Haidt. Here's what they're going to be. I want to know one thing that big tech can do. I want to know one thing that schools can do. And I want to know one thing that parents can do. Age gating is what we most need from big tech. Uh, we, just as bars have to check IDs, I think platforms and porn sites should check some sort of verification. Uh, Congress is going to have to force them to do that. They're not going to do it otherwise. Uh, what schools can do, phone-free schools, it's a no-brainer. Don't tell me that you have a rule, oh, they can't use their phones in class. That, that's nothing. They do use it in class, and they use it in between classes. It has to be that you lock up the phone first thing in the morning, you give it, give it back at the end of the day. Phone-free schools, hugely effective. Everyone loves it after the first couple of weeks. And the third thing that parents can do is contact each other. Contact the the uh, 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 thread and all agree. We're not going to give our kids smartphones till high school. We're going to keep this stuff out of middle school. And we're not going to let our kids open social media accounts. 16. So those are three ways that we can coordinate to roll back the phone-based childhood. Jonathan, I, I lost you there for a second, but we got the gist of what you said. I, I'm, I've been using the word mingle. I am on a, a one-person crusade to shine a light on that which is driving political polarization and our disconnect as a society, much of it driven by connectivity. And so these words that you wrote jumped out at me. You said, this is one of the founding insights of sociology. Strong communities don't just magically appear whenever people congregate and communicate. The strongest and most satisfying communities come into being when something lifts people out of the lower level so that they have powerful collective experiences. How can we get our kids to have more collective experiences? Yeah. So um, we have to take responsibility 
or immersing them in communities and activities. If you're religious, take your kids regularly to, to church or synagogue. And try to have um, uh, friends over, try to, try to give them groups, places to put down roots. Um, it's going to be harder than it was 40 years ago. We can't just send our kids out and say, don't come home till the streetlights come on. Uh, but we need to find ways that kids, kids, that our kids can be with each other and with adults, not with not their screens. I'm, I'm gonna, sorry. I can see my microphone. Can see. That's okay. I'm going to help you wrap this up. Here's what Jonathan Haidt advocates in the anxious generation, more unsupervised play, no smartphones before high school. No social media before 16 and phone free schools. There's a lot more to it. I've only scratched the surface. The book is terrific. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. I hope you'll come back. I certainly will. And can I just say, if anyone's in New York City, come to the northwest corner of Union Square Park today and tomorrow. We have an amazing art exhibit that dramatizes what's happening to our kids. That's excellent. Wish I were there. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Okay, gang, there you go. Jonathan Haidt, I've, I've been so looking forward to the publication of the book because I read it in advance and also to having that conversation. Do you now see why I put him in a league with Putnam and with Bishop and with Murray and with Louvre and with Twangy? It's, it's, it all fits together. Like It all fits together, at least in my view. It, it, for me, the exploration of this subject began, and you know that I, I did this. If you watched me speak around the country 10 years ago, I was alarmed by the way that the media and, and just sort of on the cusp of social media were accentuating the political divide among us. And now I see it in much larger picture terms. We're disconnected from one another politically. Our kids are disconnected from one another socially. And we've got to mingle. We've got to figure out where can we get together and have common experience, the sort that used to come from military service when a broader swath of society were bearing the responsibility for military service. Like, I'm, I'm asking you, where do you go that you see people who are not from your demographic and you have encounters with them and conversations with them? That's what that's what this crusade of mine is all about. And, and Jonathan Haidt is a really important part to to kind of bolster it with all the science. Let's talk about our kids. Let's talk about what you just heard from Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist from NYU, the same individual who co-authored The Coddling of the American Mind with Greg Lukianoff and now back with The Anxious Generation.